So I have the distinct pleasure now of introducing you to my wonderful wife. If Tana's in the back, have her come out, because I want uh, to introduce you, her with her here. Um, she is really the health leader of the Amen family. And uh, Tana is a nurse, surgical ICU nurse. What does that mean? She worked at a level A trauma center at Loma Linda one of the world's best trauma centers, but she worked with the sickest people in the hospital, often who had severe brain injuries. She learned, Loma Linda is in the San Bernardino County, uh, one of the smoggiest counties in the world, and they also live longer around Loma Linda than anywhere else. Why? Aha, come up. So she has been able to take incredibly healthy food and put it so that it tastes amazing, so that you never feel deprived. And so as we began to really embrace this lifestyle and live this way, for my first for my public television special, Change Your Brain, Change Your Body, I said, sweetheart, would you write the cookbook for it? And she's like, I'll do that. And it was a bestseller. In fact, Barnes & Noble called us and said, can we carry it? We're like, okay. Um, and then she wrote, um, get healthy and eat healthy with the brain doctor's wife and then live longer with the brain doctor's wife, which is always, of course, my goal, to live longer <laughs> with the brain doctor's wife. And she has a new book. <laughs> she has a new book coming out um, in May, in, no, April. April. April, called The Omni Diet. Uh, and I'm so proud of her. Whenever people go, okay, how do I put this in my life? Go, talk to Tana. So Tana is gonna give you the skinny on how to do it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is my husband awesome or what? I never get tired of listening to him. You know, I think everyone needs a hero and a role model, and my husband is at the top of my list. I just think he's wonderful, and we make a great team. But I do have to say, it's not really fair that I have to follow him, because he gets to come up here and make you laugh and make you love him, and then he sends me up <laughs> to ruin your appetite. <laughs> At least for the things that are harmful to you. But if you listen to what I have to say today, it could change your life forever. So I'd like to pass these principles on to you. Like my husband said, I just finished my fifth book. I'm very excited about it. And it, it is the Bible of everything I do, all of my principles and lifestyle recommendations. And the cookbooks I've written, I have over 350 recipes that really teach you how to eat and gives you a roadmap to great food and great health all at once. So I'm gonna share some of these principles with you. But before I do that, I wanna play a little game with you. I have three very common foods. These are things that you're all familiar with. And I'm gonna show you an ingredient list for each one. Hopefully you can see these, can you see these? Okay. And I want you to tell me which one you think would give you the most energy, the best health, and ability to serve, whether that's your family, your mission, your business, yourself. So I want you to take a look at these, and I'm gonna show you the ingredient list. Now, if you're sitting next to a chemist, that's great. If you're not, I've summarized it to make it easy. In bag A, we have a chicken-based food. It's got one sugar, six cheap hydrogenated oils, and two controversial preservatives. In bag B, it's a salmon-based food. This has zero sugars, zero controversial preservatives, 23 supplements, things like fish oil and vitamin D, B vitamins, digestive enzymes, and in bag C, we have another chicken-based food. 
This one has three cheap oils, one hydrogenated oil, six sugars, added gluten, eight preservatives, and a dough conditioner. Well, that was easy. Does anybody choose A or C? No. Okay, sign of intelligent life. Okay, so in bag A, we have chicken nuggets. And the controversial preservatives, one of them is TBHQ, which has been shown to cause stomach tumors in 1 30th of an ounce. And dimethyl polysiloxane is an anti-foaming agent. You may remember they outlawed, um, it's a silicone-based agent when they outlawed it in women's breast implants. But apparently the FDA still thinks it's okay to feed your children. And I'm gonna show you C next, since nobody picked that one. Healthy, fat-free chicken wrap from Subway. So this one has a dough conditioner, which has been outlawed in Europe, in almost all of Europe, but in the UK, where it's still legal to put it in food, they have to put warning labels on it because it has been shown to cause asthma. We have no such thing. The one that you all picked is what I feed my dog. So, Now, I know that you, some of you came here to make some changes today that um, will improve your lives and your business and whatever you're involved in. I'm gonna ask you to make a commitment to feed your family and yourselves at least as well as you would feed your dog. Are you willing to do that? Yes. Great. So I wanna introduce you to my most challenging client. This is a woman, middle-aged woman with a 20-year history of recurrent cancer. And she unfortunately had an undiagnosed autoimmune disorder as a child, which made her very sick, hospitalized a lot, multiple surgeries. Um, she had hormonal imbalances, and she went through a six-month bout of really serious, significant depression. Mood swings, digestive issues, acne, skin rashes, um, and she was at risk for some other issues. At one point, her doctors had given her prescriptions for nine different medications. That's when she said, I'm done. I'm done with this, and I want a better way. So she went to her doctors and asked, what are my options? One of her doctors said, there's nothing you can do. It's your genes. It's the luck of the draw. Her other doctor told her that she was in denial, and maybe she should see a psychiatrist to help her learn to accept and move forward. And I have to tell you, those were some pretty challenging times. It wasn't always easy, but sometimes hitting the depth of despair and pain, that's what led me to where I'm at now to share my message with you. But the most important thing that doctor told me was that I needed a psychiatrist. I actually highly recommend them. <laughs> but I want to clarify, I was never a patient at the Amen Clinics. An ongoing project, maybe, but not a patient. <laughs> my husband frequently tells me that I'm a psychiatrist's dream, and I'm not sure that's a compliment, but... <laughs> so my new book is based on this concept of nutrigenomics, which basically says that the food you eat and the drugs you take talk directly to your genes on a daily basis. For some of you, this is really good news. You make some simple changes, you're turning on health-promoting genes and you're turning off disease-causing genes. But for others, this is not a good thing. And you might need to pay attention and make some serious changes. I like to think of this as designer genes. So what pattern are you choosing to design your genes? If you could design the perfect set of genes. Are you choosing an inflammatory disease-causing pattern? Or are you choosing an anti-inflammatory, health-promoting pattern? Because the choice really is yours. And this story of two gorillas demonstrates nutrigenomics perfectly. I love this story. The gorilla on the left is a wild gorilla, and the gorilla on the right is a domestic gorilla in the zoo. 
Wild gorillas do not die of chronic diseases. They don't die of heart disease, diabetes, anything like that. They're either poached or they die of acute diseases like salmonella and respiratory infections. But it's a different story for domestic gorillas who live in zoos. Number one cause of death is heart disease. And this is a worldwide phenomenon. And veterinarians have tried to figure it out for a long time. And at the Cleveland Metro Zoo, they had two gorillas dying of heart disease, Beeback and Makolo. So they took this very seriously and decided they had to do something to change it. So after analyzing every area of the gorillas' lives, they decided to start with their diet. Because you see, gorillas in the zoo get nutritional cookies. They're designed to contain all of the nu nutrition that gorillas need. And they taste really good, so the gorillas gobble them up very quickly. So they thought, well, let's try giving them the diet of a wild gorilla. And they started feeding them 11 pounds of greens with nuts and seeds and berries and bamboo mixed in. And they started scattering it all over their habitat. So now the gorillas had to forage, got them moving more. They were eating the other, their cookies really quickly. And an amazing thing happened. Within one year, the gorillas lost 65 pounds each. And gorillas in zoos also have these neurotic behaviors, and Beeback and Makola were no exception. They have this habit of pulling their hair out, and they regurgitate their food up to four times an hour, and they re-eat it. Sort of disgusting, if you think about it. Within a year of this new diet, they also stopped those behaviors. And this makes me think about the patients that come to our clinics who suffer from the same types of disorders, things like hair pulling, and eating disorders, were the gorillas crazy? Or were they being poisoned? But like Cookie Monster, the gorillas, <laughs> the gorillas were really grumpy and they missed their sugar for about a week. It takes about a week. And they got over it and they got healthy. And that's what I'm going to ask you to do. Get over it and get healthy. And it also brings up, this story also brings up a really interesting idea about calorie restriction, which has been the one thing shown to extend life and decrease disease. But the studies are still coming in on humans because it takes about 120 years to get all of the, the research back and the evidence back. Turns out there's a lot of side effects to calorie restrictions. Things like decreased testosterone. Not a good thing. So, and many other things. So scientists started looking at what processes do, does calorie restriction affect? Maybe we can approach this a different way. And it turns out the quality of your calories is more important than the quantity of your calories, as demonstrated by the gorillas. It's not as simple as calories in versus calories out. Now, I don't know about you, but this makes me really happy to know that the days of leg warmers and leotards and spending half of the day in the gym are gone, because it doesn't work like that. But I know that some of you are probably still attached to your leg warmers and leotards. So let me show you this chart to prove to you that it doesn't work this way. If my husband takes me to Cheesecake Factory to celebrate something, and I order a classic cheeseburger and a peanut butter cheesecake, I have to have sex for more than 24 hours straight to make up for that one mistake. But I finally started to realize why my husband keeps trying to take me back to Cheesecake Factory. So what it boils down to, you can mimic calorie restriction in a very simplified fashion. I'm going to explain this. The quality of your calories actually matters more than the quantity. Exercise really is the fountain of youth. Unmanaged stress will make you fat and kill you early. Sleep is critical for weight loss and overall health. And you can fill the gaps with supplements. But these things work synergistically. You can't just pick one. They work together, and they work at the genetic level. They actually turn on health-promoting genes and turn off disease-causing genes. So there's many reasons to exercise, and calories is not even on that list. So I want you to not only to exercise in a traditional fashion, but ladies, you need to lift weight. 
I'm an ICU nurse, and I've seen a lot of things in the hospital, and one thing that I know is that trauma patients and burn patients require four times more energy than an average person. And you can't store protein in your body, except in your muscles. You need muscle mass. That's, where, that's what your body pulls from. That's the reserve when you're sick. So I thought that these stats were really interesting because I actually saw this happen a lot. Turns out the number one cause of death in the elderly is not disease. It's frailty. They can't recover. They get the same things that we get, and they can't recover from them. And like I said, the energy requirements are much higher. But what's interesting is less than 50% of people who are discharged from the ICU are able to return to work a year later. And the difference is muscle mass. The ones who had more muscle mass had a greater recovery. The ones who had diminished muscle mass, actually some of them never fully recover. So I want you to pay attention to that when you're working out. Don't be afraid of some muscle. So I teach a class at our clinics, and one of my clients, uh, Tammy, came to me and she said, you know, I'm, everything makes sense to me. This is working really well for me except for one thing. I can't give up my addiction to donuts. I stop every morning, they're just, they're warm, and they call my name, and she said, the idea of eating the same thing every day is just, I, I just can't imagine doing that. And I said, but you are eating the same thing every day, it's just something that's killing you. So, by the way, Tammy is diabetic, and with medication, her blood sugar tends to run 150 to 160, which is really high. So, this is how I help Tammy overcome her addiction to donuts. So chronic hyperglycemia, or high blood sugar, leads to diabetes mellitus. This is very personal for me. My grandmother died of the effects of diabetes, and it was devastating. Um, I was really close to my grandmother, and she had this amazing softness about her. She was 4'11", and she weighed about 200 pounds, and she had a big belly. But as a child who was sick a lot, my grandmother used to grab me and put me on top of her belly and comfort me, and I thought, I actually associated that with comfort, until I realized it was killing her, literally, from the inside out. And when I speak at drug rehab centers, and I show these symptoms, ringing in the ears, sweatiness, you get really hungry, racing heart, the people that I'm speaking to always assume that I'm talking about drug withdrawal. But it's not, it's low blood sugar, it's hypoglycemia. So, Sugar is truly addictive in a physical way, not just a psychological way. You get low blood sugar, you have cravings. You indulge, your blood sugar spikes, your insulin spikes, then your blood sugar crashes. Then you get all of those symptoms that I told you about. So, by the way, I want you to pay attention. Pasta, rice, and bread are equal to a big bowl of sugar. I want you to make that association today because they all break down to sugar, including brown rice and wheat bread. So wheat bread and white bread are actually higher on a glycemic index than sugar, table sugar. Now my grandmother did have neuropathy. Um, this is very common in diabetics. It's ulcerations and your toes turn black and it's very painful and she would have had to have her toes amputated. But she died of heart disease first. And did you know that sugar actually increases your cholesterol more than dietary cholesterol does? And if you've ever seen the effects of stroke on a diabetic patient, it's not fun. And m many of them never walk again. My grandmother did go blind. So I had to give her her insulin shot starting at 11 years old. And I was terrified, horrified. Um, but my mother worked and there was no choice. And the nurses told me that I could kill her if I gave her the wrong dose. Um, so I practiced on an orange. But oranges don't die of insulin overdose. So this was fairly traumatic and it may have had something to do with me becoming a nurse. And did you know that Alzheimer's disease is now referred to as type 3 diabetes? because it turns out that insulin is actually not only made in the pancreas, it's actually made in the brain. But obesity interferes with this process. In fact, obesity um, is one of the number one, excuse me, depression is one of the number one common side effects of obesity. 
And women are much more significantly hit by this. We actually make 50% less serotonin anyways. Cancer feeds on sugar. Cancer cells are eight times more metabolically active than regular cells. They need instant energy, and sugar is the best way to get that. If you want to decrease your risk of cancer, get sugar out of your life. So sh sugar also sticks to protein and collagen in your body, and it destroys it. And as you can see by this 39-year-old woman, it's really devastating. <laughs> But it does the same thing to your internal organs, especially your pancreas, which is the most hit from having to overwork so hard. And fructose does this seven times faster than glucose does. So I'm going to get hate mail when I tell you this next part. I know it, because I always do. Some of you will hate me for this. But fructose is toxic to the liver, and it leads to non-alcoholic fatty liver. So the new darling sweetener of the day that's low glycemic, is agave, right? Some of you use that? How many people use agave? It's 80 to 90% fructose. That's why it doesn't spike your blood sugar. Because where do poisons go to be detoxified? Your liver. They don't spike your blood sugar. And fructose leads to hypertension and gout. So a lot of the people that I coach in our classes, one of their main complaints is painful, swollen joints. When I get them off of sugar, it's amazing. Within days, that goes away. The swelling goes away. They'll get off of chronic use of ibuprofen just from getting rid of sugar in their diet. My sister Tamara was one of my clients. And actually, Tamara, um, she's my half-sister. She's much younger than I am. And she never wanted anything to do with anything her older nerdy sister had to say. She was busy doing drugs and partying. and. When she finally wanted to settle down and have a family, she was very unhealthy. One day she called me, and she was terrified. She'd been to the doctor, and the doctor told her um, that she was very high risk for heart disease and diabetes, and gave her three prescriptions to start off. That's when she called me terrified and said, OK, I'll do whatever you tell me. She didn't want to take the medication. Now, I'm not a physician, so I didn't tell her, don't take the medication. What I told her instead was, if you're not going to take it, give me two weeks. Give me two weeks. If it works, you're on your way. If it doesn't, then consider taking the medication. Now, I didn't need Tamara to tell me about her diet. Her lab values told me everything. But she was being tested for autoimmune disorders and um, inflammatory disorders because her, not only did she have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, high triglycerides, dangerously low vitamin D, but her CRP, or C-reactive protein, which is a sign of inflammation in your body, was 7.2, which means she's got significant inflammation, and they're going to try and figure out. They were testing her for Crohn's and um, uh, rheumatoid arthritis because she had the swollen joints. As I predicted, Tamara's diet was sad. She was on the standard American diet. She ate nearly no vegetables or fruit of any kind. It was all processed foods, sugar, bread, pasta, cereal. So I told her that I wanted her to start with an elimination diet, that I wanted her to get rid of sugar, bread, pasta, rice, processed foods, soy, dairy, alcohol, and coffee for a month. And she looked at me and she said, I'll starve to death. That's everything in my house. I assured her she would not starve to death. In fact, I wanted her to eat four, actually four to six times a day. In her case, I wanted her to start out with more. That's the cornerstone of this program, is that we don't want you hungry. So then her face lit up. She was very excited. She said, okay, whew, I can do this then. But she had no idea where to start. So to make it simple, I told her, eat like a gorilla. Massive amounts of greens, a little bit of fruit, some nuts and seeds, and add lean protein. And she said, isn't that going to be boring? And I said, no, you know, that's up to you, but I think what's boring is not being able to play with my children, not being able to have sex with my husband, which is what she was experiencing, and being on government assistance because you're too sick to work. That's boring. So I sent her my cookbooks and with over 300 recipes of how to do this, and she did everything I said. And within one month, 
Actually, she called me two days later, and she said, she was crying. And she said, I can't believe it's the first time in years that I've had a normal bowel movement. Now, I'm sorry to talk about my sister's bowel movements, but I'm a nurse. I got over body fluids and body fluids 101. Um, she was spending three to five hours a day in the bathroom with painful diarrhea, which is why they were testing her for Crohn's. So within a week, the swelling in her hands was gone. Her knuckles, the skin on her knuckles had been splitting and bleeding when she would change her baby's diapers. It was gone within one week. Within two weeks, she lost 14 pounds, and she had so much energy, she didn't know what to do with herself, so she went and got a full-time job, first time in years. And all of her lab values were normal within six weeks. Within six weeks, she lost 25 pounds. And that CRP, or that measurement of inflammation, went from 7.2 to less than 0.5. That's without medication. This is her 12 months later. She lost 60 pounds, working full time, tons of energy, and she has a new passion for life because her brain works better. But like Tamara learned, great health is not about, is about abundance. It's not about deprivation. So when people come to our house for a meal, they don't notice that there's no bread on the table. They don't miss the starches. There's, there's no starch of any kind on our table usually. Because when you learn to cook right, it's an art. It's about balancing your hormones and stimulating your taste sensations. And if you do that, you'll be healthier, more energetic, and you'll have a smaller butt. So I'm going to share with you some tips and principles. High quality calories. So we've mentioned that. Get 70% of your nutrition from whole, unprocessed, plant-based foods. Get 30% from protein-rich foods, and that includes vegetarians. So pay attention to how much protein you're getting. Get them from vegetarian sources if you have to. And pay attention to the fact that there might be something missing, and fill it with some supplements. Eliminate sugar, bread, pasta, rice, other grains, dairy, soy, alcohol for one month. This is an elimination diet, and it will really decrease the inflammation, and you'll find out quickly what you've been allergic to, what you've been reacting to. You'll be amazed at how much more energy you will have. Go gluten-free forever. There's no reason for you to eat gluten. And eat grains like a condiment when you do eat grains. In other words, Small amounts, not more than about a half a cup at a time, and not every day. Your brain, what's that? Oh, you want the slide back, okay. Absolutely. Um, people are always a little surprised when I tell them to eat grains like a condiment. But like I said, they all break down to sugar, even the whole grains, so eat small amounts of them and get most of your carbohydrates from massive amounts of vegetables. Are we good? Yeah. Okay. Your brain is 80% water, so you need to constantly rehydrate it. So drink about half of your body weight in ounces each day. If you're 120 pounds, that's about 60 ounces. But don't go over 100 ounces without talking to a physician, because you want to make sure your electrolyte is balanced, your electrolytes are balanced. And don't drink your calories. Now, I think of protein like a natural medicine that you get in small doses. What do you do with the medicine? You don't take large doses of it because it makes you sick. Small doses throughout the day so you can absorb it, and you have it with each meal because protein does the opposite of sugar. It balances your blood sugar, it um, increases focus, and it balances the hormones of metabolism. And if you cheat, though, do it with protein. I'd rather you cheat with protein than with carbohydrates because protein, like I said, balances those hormones of metabolism. It sends the signal to your brain that you've eaten and you're full and you're satisfied. Sugar actually does the opposite. You can gorge and you might be uncomfortable around the waist, around your belt, but your brain never gets that signal. Think smart carbohydrates. So don't skip breakfast. My favorite example of a smart carbohydrate is, are smoothies. You can hide the most amazing things in them. Um, that I, my, my husband's here, so I can't say too much. But I do about four times more greens than I do fruit. Only about a half cup of fruit, some protein, some healthy fat. 
And first time my husband saw me making it, he said, there's no way you will ever get me to drink that. I said, you have been for about a month. So you don't taste it, they're great. Use lettuce wraps for sandwiches instead of bread. And one of my best tips of the day is shirataki noodles instead of pasta. Anybody familiar with shirataki noodles? Yeah. Oh, quite a few of you. Okay, I like miracle noodles because they don't have any soy. Avoid the soy-based ones. And these are, uh, the few calories that are in them are not digestible because they're pure carbohydrate, excuse me, they're pure fiber. The carbohydrates are fiber. So they bind to sugar, balance blood sugar, and they're wonderful. You can use as many of them as you want. So they're a great tip for people who are pasta lovers. Use veggies for dipping instead of chips. And don't allow the waiter to leave bread on the table. Just have him take it away immediately. Make one decision, not 30. Focus your diet on healthy fats. That means avoid fried fats, trans fats, and most animal fats, but not all. Pay attention to portion sizes. And swap your condiments out. Um, so instead of mayonnaise, or ketchup or barbecue sauce, try fresh salsa or hummus or, or guacamole. Use some healthy fats in there. The worst thing that ever happened to our society was the fat-free craze. They're called essential fatty acids for a reason. You need to have them to prevent neurodegenerative diseases and for many of the bodily functions to make you healthy. And eat from the rainbow. So this means I want you to eat fruits and vegetables of as many different colors as possible. But ketchup, mustard, and grape jelly do not count. <laughs> so always be prepared. Make enough food for dinner that you have leftovers for the next day. Pack them in advance and take it with you. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Would you ever take a European vacation and not plan ahead? Not make sure that your passport was ready and you had the proper clothes and you had the right place to stay and you knew where you were going? No. So why would you do that for the most important thing in your life? Your health. Be prepared. Cook with brain healthy herbs and spices. This will help you lose your belly and boost your brain. Some of these are so potent and so amazing with what they offer for our health, they should be kept in the medicine cabinet instead of in the kitchen. They're phenomenal. They're very important. They're very, they'll also help you to cut out the sauces. So if you want to add a lot of flavor so that you don't miss those sauces, this is a great way to do it. So by the way, I mean, garlic and oregano boost blood flow to the brain. And saffron has been shown to actually be as effective as most antidepressant medications. And cinnamon boosts the tension and is an aphrodisiac for men, as though they need help. <laughs> See, I thought you hear the yeah. So this is my mother. Within a couple months of starting my program, she was down 35 pounds, went from a size 12 to a size two. She has literally aged backwards. At 65, she looks better than she's ever looked. And this is one of my favorite stories. Mari was one of my clients who is a beautiful woman, as you can see. She owns her own highly successful company. She's driven, she's amazing. And two weeks after she started my class, she stood up and revealed to the entire group that she is still bulimic since adolescence. And she hasn't even had one sober food day until she learned how to eat. Since she's taken my class, she's actually controlled her bulimia completely. And she was actually fairly angry because she said, how come no one ever taught me how food actually affects my body? They taught me so much garbage in school that I will never use. But the one most important thing, no one bothered to teach me. And the really cool thing is within two weeks of starting my class, she came in and told me that she made a million dollar deal at work because her brain was working better. She lost her brain fog. She used to have her employees do these, this work for her and it was never as successful. So a new census <laughs> has actually predicted that we could have four and a half million centenarians by the middle of the century. And if that's true, this idea of longevity becomes really important. How many of you want to live to be 100? So you need to pay attention to this. 
And the definition of longevity is a long duration of individual life. Unless you're an ICU nurse, then it's not such a good thing because I know a lot of ways that we can keep you alive for a very long time. And I don't know about you, but I want no part of this. So if you know you're gonna live to be 100, you better start taking care of yourself now. So I've adopted this term for myself instead. It's health span. It's how long you live in a healthy state and you're resistant to disease and you have more passion for life and the greatest resistance to disease. So it's true, I like to fight. I come from a family of fighters. I think it's genetic. Um, my little nine-year-old walks around telling people, I fight like a girl. You wanna see? <laughs> but I love this story. This is my uncle. The man in the picture is my uncle. He's a ninth degree black belt. He's a weapons expert. And he was inducted into the Karate Hall of Fame a few years ago. All of this is fairly amazing when you consider the fact that he lost his right leg when he was 17 years old in a motorcycle accident. And he's never let it get him down. He's a huge inspiration. So for him, eating well and taking care of himself and being healthy are essential, and he knows that. He is in his mid-60s in this picture. He looks 20 years younger at least. He's an amazing guy. So I don't want you to go to a psychiatrist to learn how to accept something that you have any chance of overcoming. If you're gonna go to a psychiatrist, go to one who's going to empower you and give you some tools so you can kick its ass. So this is my daughter. The one on the right is my daughter. She came out of the womb looking like that. So you can imagine what it's like for me as a mother. I have no idea where she gets this from. <laughs> so, so how many of you have seen the movie Soul Surfer? Okay, so not, actually not a lot of you. I highly recommend it. And having a child, I've had the honor of seeing this movie nine times. But the one great thing about it, my daughter adopted this line from the movie and she walks around saying it. There's a scene in the movie where Bethany Hamilton, who lost her arm to a shark bite, goes to her father and says, I want to start surfing professionally again. And he tells her, honey, it's not going to be easy. She looks at him and she says, I don't need easy. I just need possible. My daughter just intuitively and naturally adopted that as her mantra. And I know that the best way for me to get her to do anything is to tell her, honey, it's not gonna be easy. Because she automatically hands on hips, I don't need easy, I just need possible. <laughs> and that is the power of an effective mantra. I actually highly encourage you all to adopt one today and say it over and over and over so that any time a challenge comes up, it pops out of your mouth and in your head before you even think about it. It becomes integrated. And my husband and I took her hiking when she was seven. And it was a tough hike, and she was huffing and puffing. She was exhausted, but she never complained. And so I looked at her and I said, Chloe, you're a tough cookie. She put her hands on her hips and she goes, I don't want to be a tough cookie. I want to be a tough red bell pepper. If a seven-year-old can do this, you can do this. This is not hard. It just takes some planning and it's a paradigm shift. So my wish for you is to go out and be tough red bell peppers. Thank you.